If everybody could um, mute themselves, if they are not presenter, that would be great. And we are gonna get started soon, thank you. Okay, it's 6.03, Laurie, I'll let you call it. Let's wait two more minutes. I'm still admitting people every second. Okay. Okay, I think it's, I can still admit people if you want to get started. Stefan, you're on. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Can you guys hear? Not if you can hear me. 
You hearing me? Okay, great. Well, tonight I want to welcome you to another Delaware County Historical Society presentation. If you were with us, uh, what was that? February 23rd, we did a great one on civil rights and school segregation in 1960 in Chester, Pennsylvania. And it was well attended and everybody liked it. So we got together and said, you know what? We're gonna do another one. So that's why we're here tonight. Uh, tonight's conversation though is on a totally different topic. It's women's journey for equal rights brought to you by the Delaware County Historical Society. So first of all, I wanna thank all of you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday evening. I'm your host, Stefan Roots, or I'm your moderator. That, that's the title they gave me. And I'm gonna save you a lot of time because there's not a bio for me, but I'm charged with reading the bio of the people who will be presenting tonight. So for tonight's conversation, uh, we're honored to have five very distinguished panel of speakers. And first off, I want you guys to please welcome, and you don't have to do it out loud. You can just nod or smile or put a thumbs up. We wanna welcome professors James May and Alicia Kelly, both from Delaware Law School and both instrumental in getting the state of Delaware to ratify equal rights for women in that state. Now, before I continue with their bio, I want you to know that before we got started, we were chatting amongst ourselves. And Professor James May, I guess in, in deference to the fact that we're gonna talk about women, he wanted to put Alicia Kelly's name first, but I didn't do it. But maybe later on I will, like right now. Professors Kelly and May will provide an overview of the constitutional history of women's rights to vote and the continuing journey for an amendment for equal rights. They will also present the impact of an equal rights amendment for women. So you're gonna see a slide presentation from them. After them, we'll have Dr. Merle Horowitz, a retired school superintendent and educator for 40 years and an administrator for 20 years in the Delaware County School Districts. Dr. Horowitz is currently an accomplished author and presenter. And she will provide us with some of the shocking, and I mean shocking statistics that demonstrates the lack of women leadership in the educational arena. And she will talk about her personal career choices. And when I think back of when I was in school, most of my teachers were women. So you're gonna hear a little bit about that. Next, we'll hear from the Honorable Linda Cartesano, a Delaware County judge in the Court of Common Pleas. Her honor is currently assigned to the Family Law Division, which, uh, where she presides over domestic, juvenile, and children and youth cases. Our distinguished judge will give us a peek into the roles of women on the bench and talk about her own journey to judgeship. And last but not least, you'll hear from the dynamic representative, Joanna McClinton, who is the first woman to serve as a floor leader and hold the position of House Democratic leader in the entire history of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. So there you go, there's your bios. We're gonna go in this order. First, we're gonna hear from Professors May and Kelly. They've got about 20 minutes to give a dynamic presentation. Then Dr. Horowitz, who will handle her slides. Uh, that's about 10 minutes. Then Judge Cartesano, she'll go for 10 minutes. And then Representative McClinton, she doesn't have any slides. She's just gonna wing it, but she's gonna speak for 10 minutes. So in the meantime, when you're listening to all these wonderful presentations, I want you to get your pen prompt, get your little notepad, write some notes because we're gonna leave plenty of time for question and answers. If you guys don't have any questions and answers, let me, where is it? I got a whole sheet of them, so I'll ask some questions. So we're not gonna leave here without some questions and answers. I want you to know that if you look on your upper left-hand corner here, you'll see a little red blinky light, meaning that this presentation is being recorded. So you are all being recorded. I hope you're okay with that. Actually, you don't have a choice. We're recording this. It becomes archives for the Delaware County Historical Society, as are all of our programs. So without further ado, you guys didn't come see me. It's like a referee in a basketball game. You didn't come see the referee. I'm going to get out the way. I'll see you after the presentations. Let's go. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Laurie Grant and uh, the Delaware County Historical Society for inviting uh, myself and also Professor Jim, James May. Uh, we're delighted to come talk with you and share some of the experiences we've had working in support of an ERA in Delaware, um, but we're also both law professors. So we're gonna talk about a little bit kind of an overview, not too, not too much lawyer speak, hopefully, um, for uh, letting you, you know, have some more understanding about the law and how it relates to um, gender equality and um, the ERA. And I'm gonna share my screen. So let me just make sure I'm doing that. All right, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. I'm um, going to do an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, and then uh, Professor May and I are going to kind of take turns um, doing parts of the talk. We're going to talk just a little bit about a glimpse of gender inequality today with a few examples. Uh, we're going to talk about a brief history of treatment of women in the United States Constitution and give some examples. Um, we're going to talk about the potential um, impacts of having an ERA, like what's the point of having an ERA, what's it going to do, uh, potentially why is it so valuable to support and to try to um, get it passed finally, uh, and then talk about where we are today in the process of um, hopefully achieving uh, adoption of an ERA uh, on the federal level, and then we're going to talk um, in a pretty brief way about our experience in um, uh, the journey to the ERA uh, in the state of Delaware. So um, gender inequality is still with us. I know this is probably not news to many people in the room. And so here's just some very quick examples, pervasive violence against women across the world, uh, female infanticide, honor killings, female genital mutilation, being forbidden to drive or travel, restrictions on clothing, lack of legal right, rights, uh, including protection against rape. Uh, and here's some uh, examples closer to home, some more of the issues that we're dealing with on a daily basis in the United States. Uh, and that is also pervasive violence against women, including rape, sex abuse, domestic violence, uh, discrimination in many places, including and especially the workplace, uh, sexual harassment, employment discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, caregiver discrimination. There's actually a whole new arena of law um, about trying to prevent or have to have some remedy for caregiver discrimination because it's off, often very much gendered because very often women are the caregivers. Uh, and then economic resource inequality, including uh, women having much higher rates of poverty than men. Uh, and then the gender pay gap which I'm sure everybody's heard lots about. Um, it's still here. It's still pretty much the same place as it's been in the last 20 years. Um, inadequate social safety net, lack of work family supports like um, paid family leave. And of course we've been um, you know, thinking about all this. It's with us every day in the media with the Me Too, Me Too movement. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a big victory declared in The Economist that you know, women became more than half of the workforce. Uh, but that has not at all achieved women's equality for many reasons. Um, here's just a, a very quick chart on the pay gap. Um, you can see that it's also uh, much more exaggerated based on um, uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, so it's in um, about an 80% gap in wages between men and, when, men and women working full-time at the same jobs. Um, and then it gets much, much worse uh, for Black and African American women uh, and Hispanic and Latinas, especially. So that's just a little backdrop on kind of where we are today. And, and the ARA can play a role in trying to combat some of these inequalities. Uh, so, James, I'm going to turn it over to Jimmy. Thank you, Alicia. And let me just say good afternoon and good evening to everyone. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you to Lori for the invitation and the Delaware County Historical Society for holding this important program. It's also just such a pleasure to um, reunite with uh, form some former colleagues and also present students. Um, of course, Lori Grant, uh, a great colleague for us at uh, Delaware Law School during her time there. And then also uh, Maury Peeling, it's nice to see you too, and others who have a wider connection, including 
um, uh, several of our students, including Ed DiPietro. So I want to give you a shout out. Thank you for supporting this program. So here's the deal. Um, there, there isn't a constitutional right to, uh, to equal rights under the federal constitution, but there is in most of the world. So um, of the world's seven and a half billion inhabitants, uh, about five and a half billion live in countries that guarantee equal rights. That doesn't mean that equal rights are actually provided, but that there's constitutional protection, as you can see in the vast majority of the, of the UN recognized countries. Uh, next slide, please, Alicia. But in the US, it's different. We just have this. So if everyone can just take a look at it, this is what we have. Um, we have the 14th Amendment which provides that nor shall a state deprive any person of equal protection under the law. So that was enacted in 1868 and it was not designed to provide equal rights for women. Next slide, please. But it's, it's where our constitution stands. And fast forwarding about a century, we see that in most instances uh, up to the last couple of decades in the United States that the Supreme Court and lower courts uh, virtually almost always upheld gender differentiation, that is governmental laws that differentiated based on gender. Um, the, you know, one, of the, 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 one of the most notable situations that applying to the law is Myra Bradwell, who's an activist and a journalist and just a brilliant human being and who applied to join, to get a law license in Illinois. And Illinois didn't allow women to practice law. And she challenged that the Supreme Court upheld that. Uh, and, and that was 1872. But even after World War II, um, when women played such a huge role in the war effort, um, after the war subsided, uh, society went back to gender-based stereotypes, uh, like not permitting women to be bartenders if the state wanted to prohibit that, um, or not permitting women to serve on juries if the state permitted that, or seek divorce, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So gender differentiation was upheld. Um, and that's because of this weird constitutional construct, everybody, that you know, the constitution doesn't really say, I mean, it doesn't really mean what it says. It really just, it provides a framework for giving deference to courts you know, and, and how much, um, uh, pardon me, uh, how much deference courts should give the government when the government differentiates based on gender. And there's the, the, the three different standards of review they're called. And in 30 seconds, let me tell you what it boils down to is that when the government differentiates based upon a so-called suspect class, that's the terminology in constitutional law that uh, on race or alienage or national origin, then the government has to have a really, really good reason to do so. So it can, but it needs a really good reason. That's strict scrutiny. Everything else is rational basis review, meaning if it's reasonable, then the government action is upheld under the constitution. But then there's this middle category for differentiation based upon gender, which is called intermediate scrutiny that really is the brainchild of well, many people, but including the notorious RBG. Uh, next slide, please. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued lots of cases involving gender equality before uh, the US Supreme Court. And really it was about these standards of review is what standard of review should apply to gender-based differentiation? Should it be rational basis review? Um, or, or strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny. So all that stuff you hear about these cases, it's really about, well, how much deference should the courts give to state and federal governments when they differentiate based upon uh, gender? And you know, back when I was a, a kid playing baseball, the Supreme Court was trying to figure that out and it was sort of leaning toward strict scrutiny for gender-based differentiation, but that's not where we are in 2021. What the court did is it decided on intermediate scrutiny. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, in a case that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote for the US Supreme Court after she was asked to join or appointed to the US Supreme Court after arguing all these cases. And it was a case about uh, gender-based discrimination and admitting a student to the Virginia Military uh, Academy Institute. And that's a public institution. So the, the VMI, the Virginia Military Institute did not permit women and so that was challenged and made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And the, and the Supreme Court struck it down, finding that gender-based differentiation was based upon stereotypes that did not 
uh, enjoy what's called an exceedingly persuasive justification. So that's an actual legal standard that when states or the federal government differentiate based on gender, the, the government has to have an exceedingly persuasive justification. And more recently, for example, that was put to the test in the Sessions versus Morales case that, that we have on the slide about differentiating between the citizenship of children who were born of unwed um, uh, resident citizen mothers, but not of unwed resident citizen fathers. And the court just said there's not an exceedingly uh, persuasive justification for that differentiation. So here's the point. Government can differentiate based on gender. It just needs an exceedingly persuasive justification. And reasonable minds can disagree uh, or agree as to what that means. Next slide, please. Oh, there you have it, I think. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, there are other applications of this exceedingly persuasive justification standard more recently in cases involving uh, transgender based, based differentiation, for example, but the US Supreme Court has not yet uh, uh, identified or, or uh, declared what the standard is in those sorts of uh, differentiation situations. But some lower courts, some courts of appeal, have turned to the VMI standard of exceedingly persuasive justification. Next slide, please, Alicia. So that brings us to the federal law. Alicia, thank you. So that brings us to the federal law. And I just wanna point out what the slide says is we don't have an ERA that's adopted as part of the United States constitution. And there's actually widespread misunderstanding. Most people who are asked that question think we already have it. Like the overwhelming majority of people think we have it, but we don't, we don't have it. Um, we haven't had it. It was proposed in, 19, in the 19, early 1920s. Uh, and um, there's been you know, a slow process of voting in favor of it to try to achieve the three quarter majority of the states that is necessary to have a constitutional amendment to the US Constitution. Um, and this is a picture that I think uh, Laurie Grant had in the opening slides as well, um, showing you the women who were the force behind um, the uh, drafting of the Equal Rights Amendment back in the 20s and also um, you know, the campaign for trying to have it adopted. Um, and here's again what the Equal Rights Amendment says, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or on, by any state on account of sex. Um, the way this constitutional amendment was set up is that it had to be ratified by 38 states, three quarters of the states um, by um, a deadline. And that deadline was set for 1979 originally and then moved to 1982. Um, and then the states started ratifying, uh, and you can see the history of it here, right? 22 states in the, in the early 70s, another 12 states in the mid 70s. Um, and then we landed at the end of 1979 with 35 states. And the way the people who are supporting ERA are calling it three states short, right? So there's been in the last decade or two, a campaign for trying to get the additional three states necessary um, to adopt um, or to support and say yes and vote in favor of the ERA to get us to that magic number of 38. And um, that just happened extremely recently um, that we had Nevada in 2017, Illinois in 2018, and then finally that 38th state uh, with Virginia's adoption um, very recently in 2020. So we now have 38 states who voted um, to adopt the amendment, um, but now we're having a legal controversy over um, because they missed the deadline, right, by kind of a lot, because that was a long time ago. Uh, what can we do about that deadline? Can the deadline be withdrawn and overridden by Congress? Um, maybe it's not necessary even to do that. So there's there's like a lot of different schools of thought about how to deal with the fact that the deadline um, was not met. But a lot of people are thinking that it, it doesn't have to be. It's not part of the amendment itself, and that. Um, you know, it may take a legal process to come to a conclusion on the three states additional um, coming in in the late, you know, last decade. Um, so we'll see where that goes, uh, but it's possible to extend the deadline and there has been um, support for that. Uh, I wanna turn our attention just, just briefly, like there's, we could talk for this about this for a long time. So I just wanted to um, fix the typo and then, uh, just talk about what impact, like why is the ERA a useful, valuable thing? What could it bring um, to the table in terms of law reform and perhaps even sort of a, a new cultural um, commitment to equality? 
And that's what I would start to say is that the one really important thing about the ERA is actually the value statement itself, that there is a declaration that is meaningful and that people support that there is um, something really important about treating women with equal human dignity to every, to every other group. Uh, and so just the, it's a value statement. Um, it also becomes a bedrock principle of constitutional law if it were to be adopted. And what that means is we have some laws out there that already do provide for anti-discrimination and remedies for discrimination uh, for women, workplace protections, but they're all adopted through legislation, right? And legislation can change. And you can have a legislator who's gonna change the rules that we already have. And um, so what, what the constitutional amendment would do is to provide there being this bedrock principle of equality, you can't, it's gonna be much more difficult to roll back the protections against women and the anti-discrimination provisions we have in existing law. So it's gonna kind of like solidify and strengthen the laws that we do have. And that's very important because um, we've seen a lot of legislature, state legislatures, um, you know, thinking about rolling back women's rights in a variety of different ways in recent times. Um, one, like the last thing I'm gonna talk about is um, it really helps to fight, support the fight against violence against women. So let me just give you an example. Um, if there were systemic non-enforcement of civil restraining orders for women who are survivors of domestic violence. So if the police weren't coming when you call, right? And that was a systemic problem, which it has been historically, um, that would, could be enough to say that that is a violation. That's a, it's a form of systemic discrimination against women and um, there need to be laws and, and, and resources given to that problem um, in a way that's mandated by the constitution, not just in the discretion of a particular jurisdiction. So let me stop right there. And also, um, Stefan, can you help us where we are in time? I never put my, my timer on. How are we doing for time? I'd say we have about five more minutes left. Yeah. Here goes. Uh, I'm sorry. We're good. Okay. All right, Jim, did you wanna jump in there and add anything? Um, just the, here's what a constitution does that legislation and administrative action and policies otherwise don't do, is it sets a baseline, a normative baseline for what a country values most. So the, the federal bill of rights in our federal constitution is primarily about civil and political rights. But those are the rights that the framers of the constitution and then others on amendment uh, 26 times uh, since then have um, express what matters most. Uh, next slide. So we don't yet have a federal equal rights amendment, but we split the atom of sovereignty in our country. States have their own constitutions. Delaware's was the first, by the way. I just have to throw that in there for the state of Delaware to give it respect. Uh, 25 states, half of the country's uh, half of the country's constitute, uh, states uh, have constitutions that recognize equal rights. Wyoming's, interestingly enough, was the first, and that had something to do with statehood. And in the uh, area, uh, New Jersey in 1947 added the, its equal rights provision. Uh, it's relatively early on in this amendment process. And then many states, when they were, were ratifying the, or trying to ratify the federal amendment that Alicia uh, just spoke about, they amended their own state constitutions to incorporate uh, equal rights like Pennsylvania's by referendum in 1971, and then Maryland's in 1972 with this language. And then most recently, um, or, or, or really recently, I mean, Delaware. So Delaware was actually the third state to, to ratify the federal amendment um, uh, and, and that, you know, on its way to 38 states now, Delaware was third. Uh, and it, for the longest time, it was the only state that had ratified the federal amendment but didn't have an equal rights amendment of its own in its own constitution. So that was, uh, that was something that various legislators tried to fix over time with fits and starts. And it finally happened in 2019 with this language, the equality of rights under law shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. And that's very close to the language of the Maryland constitution right next door um, to Delaware. So next slide, please. So it passed in January of 2019. That's Vivian Longhurst, that's, that's her back anyway, um, who uh, was just um, so vigilant in 
advocating for and supporting uh, an amendment to the Delaware Constitution to incorporate an equal rights amendment. Go ahead, Alicia, next one. Oh, um, and so I just wanna end with this, uh, is that you know, really the future of equality in the state of Delaware and across the country is, is bound up in this idea of an equal rights amendment. Um, you know, across the, across the globe, the single most predictive factor uh, about all sorts of rights that are recognized, uh, uh, you know, uh, political rights, um, voting rights, rights to food, water, education, employment, the single most predictive thread in determining whether a country uh, means what it says when it's advocating, or I'm sorry, when it's recognizing those rights is whether the country has an equal rights amendment. So I think it's high time for it to be, you know, for the United States to take a turn at it as well. It's just my closing thought on that. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you. Let's give them a hand of sorts. We know how to do that. We can just look like we're clapping, even if you're on mute. Professors May and Kelly, they, they really took us on a journey there. I'm so glad this is being recorded because that, that was just a lot of stuff. And whenever I'm, I'm talking to attorneys and now professor attorneys, uh, my head just gets to spinning. So I wrote down a couple of terms like strict scrutiny for gender-based differentiation. That was, that was a pretty fascinating term there. Uh, exceedingly pervasive justification, you know, very important terms. Uh, I really love where we explained where legislation, I guess in my words, is iffy. You know, a new set of law can come and get rid of an old law, but the constitution is bedrock. That's a, that's a good word. It's what this country values most. So it's, it, I don't know. I still have a hard time understanding why men and women just don't have equal rights from the start. Why do we have to go through all this? But it looks like we do. So thank you so much for, for sharing that knowledge. I'm gonna definitely replay it because I couldn't absorb all that in 20 minutes, but there's a lot of information there and it's extremely valuable. So it's a great way to set this one off. So now we're gonna go into the world of education with Dr. Merle Horowitz. And uh, I know this is going to be exciting because she always brings the fire. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. I have been a board member of the Delaware County Historical Society since 2015 when I retired. So I'm going to take you on a 40 year journey from when I graduated college and started to work as an elementary school teacher in the Upper Darby School District in 1974. I thought it would be inter interesting to share with you what my salary was my first year teaching, $7,450. When I reflect back, I wonder how I was able to live work, pay for a car, insurance, food, with that little amount of money and how far we have come. I spent six years teaching sixth grade. And while I was a sixth grade teacher, I had gone back to get my master's in reading at the University of Pennsylvania. And I decided to become a reading specialist at the elementary level. I spent two years doing that and then decided it was time to have my first child. And I took what's called the child rearing leave in which you were guaranteed a position, but not necessarily in the school where you were employed when you took your leave. And that's exactly what happened when I returned in 1983, I was moved over to the Beverly Hills Middle School in Upper Darby as a middle school reading specialist. And I spent a few years there, um, the other side of the township, and then decided it was time for my second child. But I did something unusual. I took what's called a sabbatical leave of absence for educational purposes. I returned to the University of Pennsylvania 
to get my principal certificate with an infant. And it took me one year to do that. And then I was fortunate to be offered an elementary school position at the Erotoming School on Vermont Road in Drexel Hill, where I began my teaching career. I spent a few years doing that. And then I was asked to also become the director of curriculum for the school district. So I was doing two jobs on two sides of a building with two secretaries running back and forth. I might be in a meeting and called back to my principal's office because of a fight on the playground. I quickly excused myself from my administrative meeting and ran back to be a principal. I did this job until 1995 when I was fortunate to become the first female commissioned officer in the history of the Upper Darby School District as an assistant superintendent. And I managed um, a lot of principals, assistant principals and teachers in that role, handled all discipline for the school district. And in my back of my mind, I had hoped that maybe the door would open for me to become a superintendent once the current one retired. Well, sad to say that opportunity would not present it to myself being a female. So I chose to leave a wonderful place after 27 years and make a lateral move to the Pendelco School District in Aston, Pennsylvania, also in Delaware County. And I spent four years there as an assistant superintendent and ironically took a pay cut in that lateral move, but it was time for me to go. And then the world changed for me in 2005 when I was selected as the superintendent of the Marple Newtown School District in Broomall and Newtown Square. And there had only been one female prior to my tenure who was actually an interim superintendent in the 90s. So I was the first official female in that role in Marple Newtown. I was also renewed after five years and I had been the first one to be renewed since the 1980s in Marple Newtown. There had been a string of 10 different superintendents in a 15 year period in that district. I was thrilled that I could be a stable um, force there for that community, which is a wonderful school district. While I was superintendent, I decided to go back to the University of Pennsylvania to get my doctorate in educational leadership. And I studied a topic which is relevant even today. My dissertation was about email harassment of educators. And it was something that had never been studied before in that role. And I looked at what email had become ubiquitous across society, literally in everyone's face, all day long in the workplace, on iPads, on cell phones in the evening, email was a 24 seven uh, proposition for educators. And I studied what can happen in terms of harassment. That led me to a whole different arena called cyberbullying, which we know about today. And actually was thrilled to publish a book with an attorney called Cyberbullying in Social Media in Educational Institutions uh, in 2012. And that book is still selling today. And it, I'm thrilled that I've been able to present the topic of cyberbullying in social media nationally across Pennsylvania and the Delaware Valley. Having been a superintendent in Delaware County for 10 years, I will tell you an interesting statistic. There were 15 school districts in Delco. The largest amount of female superintendents was five of 15. Only one third of the districts hired women at that point. I will tell you another startling statistic. The average tenure of superintendents today is three to four years. So it was just incredible for me that I was able to be there for 10 and to retire 
on a high. While I was there, I was a member of AASA, which is the National Superintendents Association. Every five years, they do a very important study about superintendents nationally. And I will ask Lori Grant now to put up the first slide for me. Thank you. This was a part of the 2020 decennial study of superintendents, key findings and selected implications. You see there on this slide that in two, a year and a half ago, actually, when this was completed, 73% of the superintendents in America were male, 26.7% were female. Next slide, please. You can see the trend of female superintendents. Please look on the left corner, 1982, how few there were, and a steady incline straight up to 2020, when we now had 26.7% of female superintendents in the nation. Next slide, please. You can see here the gender trends, male in red, and female in pink. How gradually it's changing, but not anywhere near to be significant, only at 26.7% in 2020. Next slide, please. Here's some interesting thoughts about why these trends are occurring. Women are not in positions that normally lead to the superintendency. Stefan Roots earlier this evening mentioned, uh, and he was correct, that women for the most part are teachers. And being a teacher is not a position that leads to the superintendency. In my career, as I shared, I'd gone from teacher to reading specialist, to principal, to director of curriculum, then to assistant superintendent. The second point here, Women are not gaining superintendent's credentials in preparation programs. You have to go back to get a special certificate to be a superintendent of schools where you are considered a commissioned officer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. More and more women are heading into principalship positions, both at the elementary and secondary levels, but not necessarily gaining superintendent's credentials. The third bullet, women are not as experienced nor as interested in district-wide fiscal management as men. I'll stop for a moment and reflect here. Two areas where I felt I really needed to learn a great deal because I had been a specialist in curriculum and instruction were fiscal management and also buildings and grounds, facilities and maintenance renovation of buildings, etc. I literally had to study and work with colleagues in surrounding districts so I could feel comfortable in an interview discussing fiscal management and buildings and grounds. Next bullet. Women are not interested in the superintendency for personal reasons. Men, many women who are teaching or even at the principalship choose to raise children. And that can be a 24 seven job, as many of us know. I chose to do both. I raised two wonderful daughters. And believe me, I was there on the softball field and the hockey field after school so I could be the sports jock mom for my daughters. But there are women who are not interested in the superintendency for their own personal reasons. Next bullet. School boards are reluctant to hire women superintendents. That's absolutely so, with only 26% nationally in that role. Next, women enter the field of education for different purposes. Obviously, if you are a superintendent, okay, you've largely been in education, okay, sometimes as a teacher, sometimes actually in a different role, potentially business management, or pupil services, and then you might be interested in becoming a commissioned officer. And women enter late. 
Some women choose to raise families first and then go into education. Next slide, please, Lori. Now, I'd like you to focus on superintendents of color, which this study did. Look at the left-hand side. In 2000, 21 years ago, there were 5% in the nation superintendents of color. It took 10 years to go up one percentage point to 6%, and another 10 years to get to 8.6% where we were when this study was done. Next slide, please. This shows the percent since 1980. There is a steady trend as you see, but literally only to 8.6%. Very disappointing. Next slide, please. Here are the trends. There are more superintendents of color in districts with larger populations of racial, ethnic minority students makes total sense. Almost 78% of superintendents of color serve in districts with more than 26% racial, ethnic minority students also makes sense. And finally, of districts serving 51% or more racial, ethnic minority students, nearly a third are led by superintendents of color and 32% are led by women, of which 20% are women of color. And that is the final slide. Thank you, Lori. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, this evening to speak with you and I look forward to any questions later in the presentation. Thank you so much. Well, that was straight fascinating. Let's give her a hand. That was amazing. That was great. All right, so I can't let let, let that go by without a couple comments. Um, where can I start? I'm from the city of Chester, Pennsylvania. I live in Chester, Pennsylvania. We just hired a black female superintendent this year. And I've kind of casually checked her out from afar. I do community journalism here. Let me tell you, after that presentation, I'm gonna track her down and do an interview. I have some stuff to talk about now. That was pretty fascinating. A uh, couple of notes that I took on that presentation. <laughs> your, your lateral move to be an assistant superintendent in the new school district uh, came with a pay cut. So we can't call that a lateral move. We have to come up with a new name for that. That's like a slope move or, or something along those lines. I had no idea you were the mother of cyberbullying. Uh, so you're talking about email, I guess, when you did that study email was the killer app where everybody was on email. That's how, how we communicated. And I'm happy to see that you moved that into the, I guess, social media realm and wrote the book. I got to get that book. That sounds really, really cool. Superintendents, the, what did you put? The seven possible reasons why women aren't superintendents. I think five of those reasons were because women don't want to be superintendents. I thought that was pretty interesting uh, because if we didn't have that slide, we would assume it's all gender bias, but a lot of it is because maybe women just aren't built to be superintendents. And I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, but you know, I, I personally don't know many women who could go into the boiler room and, and talk comfortably with the, with the maintenance guy. You know, you just never think about all those aspects of, of being a superintendent. When we think of schools, we think about education only. And at that superintendent level, you know, you're the maintenance leader. You're the, you know, I guess you got to buy grass seed for the football field and, and books for the toddlers. I don't, know if, I don't know if I agree with that. Good. Yeah, can I jump in We here? love to have disagreements. <laughs> That's my job. Um, Stefan, it's Lori, and I just want to say that um, I, I think it's not that they don't want to be superintendents, um, because they're obviously in the field of education, and if you look at the percentage of female to male teachers, there are, the, the majority are, are women. 
what I think we're looking at here is women having to take on the majority of the responsibility of childcare and the home. And I think that the whole maintenance question and the finance question isn't just for a superintendent. As, as the executive director of Delaware County Historical Society, I am in charge of a 21,000 square foot building with leaking roofs and bad pipes and fiscal challenges. So I think it can be, this Merle's presentation can be broadened to numerous arenas. And it's not that we don't want to, it's that we have the majority of the responsibility of our own home. And when it comes to choosing career or family, unless you're very, very wealthy and can hire a great full-time nanny or have a very, very supportive spouse, it falls on you. And I think that's more of a social um, issue, but it can be all tied back to the amendment and to the legal aspect of it. All right, great comment. So hopefully we'll pick up some of this in the question and answer piece. So let's roll on to our next speaker, Judge Cartesano, someone I'm pretty familiar with, always love talking to her. And let's hear from her talking, uh, talking about being a female judge. It's all uh, yours, Linda. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, good evening to everyone. And um, thank you for inviting me to be a member of this interesting panel. One of the things I want to start off with is um, <clears throat> when preparing for tonight, I started to look for information, statistics on the number of judges and, and how many female judges we've had over the years. When I started uh, practicing law in Delaware County, um, the first female judge in the county was elected in 1982. She was the only female judge in Delaware County until her retirement. And at the time, I believe we had approximately 10 to 13 judges on the bench. Um, we now have, I'm happy to say, eight female judges out of 21 positions. So we have really come far in the 40 years of uh, the Delaware County bench. The uh, slides you have here were put together by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And this lists the number of judges in different sections. We are 33% of the common law judges in Pennsylvania. That's 144 female, 294 male. Magisterial district judges, 125 women, 364 men. In the uh, next slide, please. In the women in, um, on the bench in Pennsylvania, there are currently 13 women serving as president, as president judge in the courts of common pleas. That is the judge in each county who presides over those, that board of judges. That sounds like a lot until you hear that there are 67 counties in Pennsylvania. So only 13 women. Delaware County has not had a female president judge. We do a lot better when we hit the Superior, Commonwealth and Supreme Court. Currently we have three women out of seven member Pennsylvania Supreme Court. We are the majority on the Superior and Commonwealth Courts. Superior and Commonwealth are the courts that you appeal to from the Common Pleas Court. So on Superior Court, we've almost taken over. We have 10 women, four men, and one vacancy. Commonwealth Court, we have six women and three men. Their, <clears throat> their days are numbered on those courts. 
the uh, next slide, please. This is just a little information. The first woman appointed as a judge in Pennsylvania was from Allegheny County, was in Allegheny Court County, and she was both the county court and the Court of Common Pleas, and that was in 1930. Next slide. We have the first elected African-American female judge in the nation. She was in Philadelphia County, the Honorable Juanita Kid Stout, and that was in 1959. She was also the first African-American woman to serve on any state Supreme Court, and that was in 1988. So think about that. In the United States, no woman, no black or minority woman served on a Supreme Court until 1988. The first woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania was in 1961. And she was also the first woman to serve as the Attorney General for Pennsylvania. I did find an organization called the National Association of Women Lawyers. And I wanted to give you a, a little bit of information concerning female lawyers in the nation. This organization uh, has collected data for the last 13 years. They do it every two years. It's a national survey. They send it out to all the uh, law firms in the nation and they ask them to present their numbers. For the last 10 years, 50% of law school graduates are women. It's a pretty good number. When you look at the numbers on the representation of lawyers working in a firm, the associate level, which of course is the entry level, 53% are men, 47% are women. Pretty close. Pretty good considering women are 50% of the graduates. The next position they looked at was non-equity partner. 69% are men, 31% are women. The highest level in a firm would be the equity partner because then you're buying into the actual partnership itself. Those numbers aren't so good. 79% are male, 21% are women. In 2006, the number of female equity partners was 15%. 15 percentage, I'm sorry, 15%. 15 years later, it went up 6%. It's not really good numbers. Interestingly enough, when I looked at the uh, survey, they indicated that these numbers are almost exactly the same as they were in the 2017, 2019 survey. They talked about a, a, a term that I found fascinating. I'm not sure I understand it totally, but the basis for these numbers, the fact that in when you start as an associate, they are hiring women, almost equal, but as you move through the process of either a non-equity or an equity partnership, they lose ground. And the term they used was bias interruption earlier in the hiring process. And basically what they were looking at was that they, earlier in the process, they put criteria in place to make the playing field more equal. They have not done that when they start to look at partnerships. That's where your glass ceiling comes into effect. I'm not sure how that gets um, handled, 
I had a lot of questions for this group as to what, if they look at any other factors that go into that issue. One of my, um, one of the things I thought of was that to certainly buy into a law firm, you have to come up with a sum of money. If you're gonna be an equity partner, you've got to put money on the table. You don't come in as an equity partner just based on your workload. That may or may not be a factor that, that's considered. But they were, it, the, the concern is that women aren't moving through those ranks the way that they used to, or the way they should, I shouldn't say used to. Compensation, attorney compensation. Uh, when we talk about the same pay for the same job, they found that across the board, men made more than women. For an associate, the average attorney compensation in US dollars for men was 217,898,000. dollars For women, it was $198,687. Non-equity partners, men were $366,805. Women, $340,643. Equity partners, $861,349. Women, $728,923. There's no explanation as to why. I couldn't find anything in the survey that, that told me why the male would make more. It could be the size of the firm, might have a little something to do with it. But even in those uh, income levels, there was a difference in the pay and I thought that was pretty significant. We've, um, I, I will tell you that, that as a, a judge in Delaware County, I have not seen any uh, disparity between men and women the women are getting elected. As I said, we, we have eight um, out of 21. Last election cycle, three women were elected to the bench, only one male. Uh, a lot of that is because I think women are more uh, active now politically and getting more involved. And they used to tell you the old statistics was women got a 10% bump in the uh, polls or in the voting at uh, election time. But I, I'm glad to see at least the numbers in Delaware County are moving up. And at some point we may take half or even a little majority, we'll see. So thank you. All right, you guys know what to do now. Put your hands <laughs> together. Excellent presentation. That was interesting. Um, women in law in general. I. I couldn't help but to think about my niece. She's one of those double Ivy. She went to Dartmouth, she graduated Columbia Law and she's like three years into her, uh, what's it called, associate? Like her first job. And I'm just watching, watching to see what happens to her career and how it, how it goes. I know she has no political aspirations so I don't expect her to be you know, running for judge or anything like that. Uh, eight out of 21 in Delaware County, eight women out of 21 judges. That's very respectable based on the numbers that you presented for sure. It, it's just still troubling to hear the salary dispar disparities mm -hmm. between men and women. And you had no basis for any of that. It's just the numbers as they are. And we learned another term, bias, Interruption, <laughs> bias interruption. I think of my career. I wonder if I have been bias interrupted uh, somewhere in my career. Thank you, Linda. That Linda, was all. may I ask uh, a question sure. here? Um, you, you've talked about how Delaware County is, has been pretty progressive and, and pretty fair uh, for, to women on the bench. And I, I, I guess my question is, um, have you found that lawyers who come in front of you 
and or jurors treat you any differently than they do your male colleagues? Um, some lawyers try. Um, I've had um, male lawyers in court at times refer to me as ma'am. Um, if it's said once, might be a mistake. Um, if they do it more than once, I will usually correct them and tell them that the term is either judge or your honor. And I, I had a discussion with a male colleague when this happened and, and it was early on when I was on the bench and they, you know, they, oh, you're being a little petty. And why would you point that out? And, you know, my answer was one time is a mistake. I mean, I've had people uh, call me a, ma a master, which was our hearing officers. And, you know, we'll joke about it and that's fine. You made a mistake. And I, and I said to them, well, would you allow an attorney to refer to you as Mr. and your last name? And it was absolutely not. Well, then ma'am is not acceptable. But usually they get the message and it doesn't happen again. Now, whether it's done by accident or because they think they're going to send me a message, I'm not sure. But I've had that happen. Other than that, no, I've seen no difference. Uh, I don't see attorneys um, treating female judges differently. But we're, we do have quite a few female lawyers in Delaware County. So it's not something that the uh, lawyers are not used to. I mean, we have had female judges on the bench since 1982, usually only one at a time, but they are used to females at this time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, titles are important no matter what level you are. There was a guy I heard speak to another guy and he was upset that he didn't address him as coach. So it could go <laughs> to any level, you know, it depends on how you want to be respected. But to call a judge ma'am, I, I could see where that could rub someone the wrong way. So yes, let's hope it's a mistake and make sure you correct it right away. All right, we're coming up to our last, but not least, presentation. Representative Joanna McClinton, the first woman to serve as a House floor leader and hold the position of House Democratic leader in the history of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. I just like saying that. That just gets me excited. She has no slides, so let's do it. Thank you for your warm welcome, Stefan. Thank you so very much, Laurie, for putting this together. It's an absolute honor to be with you all this evening. I have learned so much, been here taking mental notes, hearing just the journey to equality that women in this country have been on for a long time, certainly way before I was elected or ever thought of. So I'm appreciative to all of the folks who've participated thus far um, and all of the work that we do in our respective places to ensure that there's equality and equity. I wanna give one special shout out. There are lots of friends on here, but I've gotta thank my colleague, uh, Representative Jen O'Mara, who is a tremendous warrior for her constituents and works tirelessly inside of the Capitol building, and of course, back home in Delco. Jen, thank you for making this connection. I'm so pr proud and thrilled to be here. So I am Joanna McClinton. I serve the 191st district. That includes a big chunk of the Cobbs Creek section of Philly, West Philly and Southwest Philly. And then I cross the invisible line and go into Delco where I serve Yaden Borough and Darby Borough. So I'm Southeast Delco for those who are familiar. And I have been serving my neighbors in this capacity for almost six years. A little bit about me. I'm from Southwest Philly. So the area that I still live in is where I grew up. Um, but both my parents are from North Carolina. They came up to Philadelphia in the 60s, along with so many Southerners who were a part of migrations looking for opportunities and jobs. Uh, before that, 
my grandmother, who uh, my maternal grandmother is living, my maternal grandmother, uh, whom I'm named after, Joanna McClinton, she passed when I was a very little girl. My maternal grandmother is still with me and she just turned 90 two weeks ago. And I have to start off and giving my little life journey some context without my slides, I apologize. My team is gonna hear about this tomorrow, <laughs> is that my grandmother who now lives with me, she's the granddaughter of slaves. So just to tell you a little bit about my journey, my career, my family, my background, my grandmother's the granddaughter of American slaves, not in another country, not somewhere far off, and certainly not uh, so many years ago that it's a, a long, long, long time ago, a time away. It was not that long ago that my ancestors came to this country, not because they were looking for a better opportunity or another place to go or escaping some horrors. They left amazing kingdoms in West Africa, most of them off of that continent, and came here because they were forced come here. The same way in the 21st century, I'm sure her honor is seeing trafficking cases happen from time to time. That's how we got here. We were brought here as property and there were no rights. There was no education. There was no voting. There was nothing except work, 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 work. And we were sold and separated and dehumanized. And I learned about these things growing up, but I never put it into context as until I'm at the point I am in my life now realizing, wow, how in the world was I blessed to get elected being the first woman to ever serve my district and later the first woman and the first person of color to be our caucus chair and now the first woman in the Pennsylvania House, the oldest general assembly in the nation, 244 years old we are and we've never had a woman be a leader. So I am thrilled, I'm excited, I have to be honest and confess one thing amongst friends that would have never happened without the strong support of someone like Rep O'Mara. If she wasn't where she is, I know I wouldn't be where I am. It takes so many women working together, having each other's backs and of course our allies um, of the, across the gender spectrum being with us to see these types of opportunities, particularly women history says that this might not have been the outcome for someone who's the great great granddaughter of American slaves. I'm telling you, when I was writing my personal statement to get into law school, I still remember the first line of that statement and I don't remember the rest, but this is something that stayed with me my entire life, statistically doomed for failure. When you grow up in 19143, where schools were pervasively underfunded. And I happened to be in a single parent home from about three years old. My parents separated, although we're married. Uh, you are not growing up with the best odds. Uh, my mother worked multiple jobs. Uh, she worked, worked at the University of Penn as administrative assistant for over 15 years. I think she retired at 20, 20 something. 25, she's not far, so I'm <laughs> getting some talking points. I want to be accurate since she's within the earshot. Uh, she spent 25 years there, but she also had a business, a catering business, where she opened up a deli at 54th and Greenway when I was in about first or second grade. And she worked hard after work making sandwiches, everyone's favorite cheese steaks, making soul food, catering weddings on the weekends. I mean, she worked and worked and worked. And when I was little, as much as I saw her cooking and making delicious food and enjoyed tasting batter for pound cakes, I did not grow up wanting to be a chef. From second grade, I had a list of things. I wanted to be an attorney, not because I had ever met the judge who just spoke her honor, it's because I watched Matlock in the 80s. <laughs> You're gonna think that's silly. It's the truth. I, when my brother would let me stay up late, we'd look at Matlock and I'd see him in court and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be a lawyer, like definitely gonna be a lawyer. The second thing, I wanted to be a hairdresser. Why would I wanna do that? Well, my mother, as much as I love her, <laughs> she was not good at doing hair. And my grandmother tells the story of me saying, Granny, do you have a comb? My hair is a mess in kindergarten. That's a direct quote. And my grandmother's memory, even at 90, is astonishing. Uh, so I wanted to be a lawyer and a hairdresser. And then when we joined a church in our neighborhood, and that was also around second grade, 
my pastor's wife on Tuesday nights would teach and she would have long prayer meetings and everyone seemed so lifted and light when she would finish. And I added to my list, I wanted to become a preacher. So fast forward, here we are way after all those childhood dreams. I'm proud to share that I was uh, able to go to LaSalle after college or excuse me, after high school and studied political science, uh, came out in 03, went directly uh, to the other side of Delco to Villanova Law School, uh, came out in 06, um, Three years into my legal career, I applied to go to seminary. I have not come out, but I'm only four classes away. I might have taken three classes in the pandemic in between serving my neighbors, legislating, <laughs> driving myself crazy. <laughs> but long story short, I never made it to hair school, but I went to law school with the goal to help my community and to literally level up. When you grow up working poor, you just dream about better times. You dream about better opportunities. You dream about a bigger house with more closet space. These are things that like you literally grow up hoping will one day work out. So when I was in law school, I didn't have my eyes set on one particular job, but I said, if I keep going to school, sooner than later, we'll be able to have a better life, a better home, less stress, a little less. So long story short, I ended up starting my career as a public defender. I spent one summer at a housing uh, agency. It's still in existence, regional housing, legal services. I loved doing the work with nonprofits who were doing development work. I didn't love the transactional work side of it. So I decided, let me try something else. So my second summer, I was at the Philly District Attorney office where I absolutely loved court, but I did not love prosecuting people. I just didn't feel righteous enough. So the next semester, I was an intern at the Defender Association, which is Philadelphia's public defender office. Ended up getting a job there. I stayed there almost 10 years. In that 10 years, what was going on in my life? Well, I thought I had problems as a child, but I started meeting people who had serious serious problems as a child, very pervasive poverty. And when you're both poor and accused, getting ready to lose your liberty in a system that is not fair, neither historically or systemically, it was a learning experience, going in and out of prisons, visiting my clients, talking to them, um, spending time building up a defense or mitigation, working out non-trial dispositions. I learned so much about standing up and advocating for other people in their times of crisis when many people, and I don't want you to make a face, Your Honor, but many people don't always wanna hear what the public defender in the room has to say, because we might tend to be the bleeding heart liberals. We might go on and on and, okay, 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 okay. But I learned how to navigate a system where so much is stacked against you, where as a young woman, many of my clients would ask, Miss McClinton, how old are you? And I had to learn in a firm, serious voice to say, I'm old enough to have been to law school, pass the bar exam and be here representing you. <laughs> With a straight face, I didn't laugh. But that experience really changed my life because the problems that I thought my family experienced, I recognized there's so many more issues, so many more concerns. And when my father was living, God rest his soul, he would ask me, what is your long-term goal? I said, dad, I don't know, but I really wanna help people before they go to jail, before they get accused of something, before they have a negative encounter with police, before they're arrested. And I never could picture what type of career trajectory I was on, but I left the Defender Association in 2013 at the urging of a mentor who's now on the bench, Judge Tamika Lane. She and I worked together as public defenders and she encouraged me to apply to go work for our state senator. Now, in my mind, after doing political internships in college, I thought, there's no way I'm gonna get a job with this Senator. He doesn't know me, he's never heard of me, there's no hookup, there's no patronage, but long story short, I'm so grateful that I applied, that I went to Harrisburg, and I must say, since we're talking about women's rights tonight, the first thing I saw during the job interview when I was taken to the floor of the Senate, not the House, I almost said House, was there were a lot of men everywhere. <laughs> I mean, a lot of them, a lot of them, and many of them, in my observation, had probably been doing that job for a little while. 
I was astonished because the first thing I thought about was being in court with sentencing guidelines, with mandatory minimums, with so many different things that I believe were inherently inappropriate. When we elect judges to be able to look at circumstances and make these decisions, why do we keep getting these laws from Harrisburg? So long story short, I went to work for my senator. He's also serving Delaware County, Senator Anthony Hardy Williams. Loved the job, did not go into that job to run for office. So don't count your cousin out, Stefan. It doesn't have to be on your life plan. I'm telling you, I went to that job because I thought all the things I've seen in court, I can go behind the scenes and make sure that the policy developed is progressive, that it's helping people, not hurting people, that every experience I had with a client where I left upset or I left concerned or I wanted to do more and couldn't do more, we can actually change the laws. So I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. Suddenly, a vacancy came up in my neighborhood and my coworkers in the office were like, you live in the district? And I would say to them, and? why are you telling me this? Lots of people live in this district. And they said, well, you should think about running. And I said, I don't think so. I have a very good government job. The Senator and I are on the same page. I'm writing, not in my voice, as he'd say, in his voice. I'm doing things in a positive way that's enhancing our work here. There's no way I would disrupt that train to try to run for something. Well, that was my thought, but someone would say there were other plans that I didn't know about yet. In June of 2015, after months of my colleagues and coworkers teasing me about all of that, the Senator and I had a serious conversation and he asked me, you know, why didn't I think about it seriously? And I said, because when you work behind the scenes, you see the good, the bad, the ugly. You see the things that people like, you know, the positive events, the great things where everybody's happy, but you also get the calls on the phone from constituents who feel that government's not doing enough and government is in the way. And I don't want that on my young, single, young, adult back or shoulders. I don't want to deal with those types of pressures. So we had a big meeting and there were so many neighbors who were very, very interested in doing all of this work. And as we went around the table to talk about our life experiences and why we were potentially interested in getting support to run for this seat, I remembered the times in court where I wanted to do more, where I felt like I should be speaking to someone besides this jury in front of me. I thought I should be doing something different. And all of those experiences, along with the work I did as a youth minister in my church for over 10 years, planning activities for kids, picking them up, driving them around, trying to um, mentor them and push them towards their potential and reaching their goals in life, I recognize that no, I might not have had a political trajectory, but this was an opportunity I should not pass by because I'd be at work on the floor of the Senate thinking to myself, boy, I could probably be giving a speech right now. I could be introducing legislation right now, but I was in my head and too afraid to try. So I got out of my head, I tried and look at my neighbors, they chose to choose me out of several people running in that race. And I'm proud with their support, I'm in the space that I am now. Many people talk about, oh, you're the leader. It's like, nope, first I serve my neighbors in my district. And in addition to serving my neighbors in my district, I'm now proud to serve my colleagues. Now to so many people you think, oh wow, well you just flew like an airplane. But the truth is I did not. The first women were elected to the legislature in 1923. That's right, 1923. It's been 98 years since the first women were elected to the General Assembly until the time when we in our house have a woman as a leader. Those women were Alice Bentley, Rosie Young, Sarah McClune Gallagher, Helen Grimes, Sarah McKinney, Lily Pitts, Martha Spicer, and Martha Thomas, all Republican women who ran and were successful. And then the first woman in the Democratic Party was elected in 1932. Anna Brincato. And then the first African American woman was elected in 1938, Crystal Bird Fawcett, who, like myself, was also an attorney who was from Philadelphia and a proud Penn Law graduate. So I recognize that I'm standing on the shoulders of so many women so many women who've come before me, whose names and organizations are not known, and that I'm recognizing that being a woman in leadership and serving in this moment in time, it just is a privilege, it's an honor, but the biggest key is keeping the door open so that many women, many women, excuse me, 
Representative O'Mara and others who are not even here yet will go sky high above me and be running that Capitol building. One day we'll have a woman governor. One day a woman who's representing us in the Senate. One day a woman of color in the congressional delegation. Pennsylvania politics has so much farther to go in terms of parity, equality, and then I'll just wrap up with these statistics if I can find <laughs> the right sheet just so you can have a little bit of context. Yes, here it is. So these are my final comments because I know it's time for questions. There are 59 women currently in the House out of 203 members. So we're at 29%. In the Senate, there are 50 members and there are 14 women. So 28% of the Pennsylvania Senate are women. All across the country, there are 2,162 women legislators. So 25% of all lawmakers and state legislative bodies. Women of color are 7% of all state legislators, 552 out of 7,383. And the last one is, out of the 7,383 lawmakers across the country, there are only 356 that are Black women, 4.8%. So I count myself blessed, privileged, but most importantly, charged up to do work to help so many people, not just in my district, but now as the leader across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you. I don't have to tell you guys to clap. That was exciting. She brings the fire for sure. So uplifting. That was great. Um, I love origin stories. I loved how you just took us all the way back to the beginning, brought us to where you are now, told us that there is still room at the end for women to represent at the state level. Let me ask you one quick question though. Has um, this political journey of yours gotten any easier since you started for yourself? <laughs> Honestly, I think that the nervousness I had to and reluctance to run for the state house uh, came back in November as a couple of colleagues were kind of giving me the elbow to run for leader. I'm like, me? What? No, now? Are you kidding me? There's so many men with lots more years. Why would I do that? I'm once again young and I don't want the weight of the House Democratic Caucus on my shoulders. Why would I do that? Why would I sign up for a job where people call all the time <laughs> when my phone never used to ring before? <laughs> so I'll say that, um, you know, the nervousness and, and, and just me, honestly, it's me taking it seriously. Like if I didn't care about these roles, I wouldn't be nervous to just jump out and try. And the study shows for women to run for office, it takes seven times to one time asking a man, because they think, why not? What do I have to lose? And not being funny, but just there's so many considerations we make from family to obligations to goals in our personal life that many of those sacrifices are not mirrored in the lives of many men. Not all, of course, but many. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that's run through all of these presentations today is that men are different than women. And it reflects in the careers that you choose, how far you go in the career, now, while you're not getting paid the same, I'm still waiting for an answer, and I don't think I'm going to get it here tonight, but we did cover a lot of ground tonight, and I'm really proud of all of you who present it. And again, I'm getting out the way because it's now time for question and answers. Those of you who are still hanging in there with us, thank you for hanging. Um, who's handling the questions? Is it you, Erica? Is it you, Laurie? Or is it yeah, you? hi, Stefan. Um, we, I think all of our um, presenters were so thorough that we haven't gotten um, tons of questions. One is, does the ERA also protect LGBTQ um, individuals? If someone wants to answer that one. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Um, there's been an active debate about whether sex equality includes anti-discrimination against sexual orientation and whether they're like parts of the same problem. And uh, there's been a big movement toward answering that question that yes, that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. 
Uh, and um, so I think that there's a lot of hope there that the ERA would be interpreted in that way. It's not obvious and it's not determinative, but it's, um, I think it's likely, especially given the last, you know, the Supreme Court opinions of late, and especially the Obergefell case, which was the same sex marriage case. Right. Um, another question, um, I guess for all of you is in a leadership role, have you found the challenges of having to be a leader yet as a woman be likable? Um, and Joanne, I, 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 you are so likable, but you are in politics. And we saw with Hillary Clinton that her likability was a huge issue. Um, and I'm wondering if you could address that. Absolutely, Laurie, uh, great question. So it's a constant battle, or I should say balance. That's the word I was actually looking for between being liked, looking nice, um, dare I say two words that I don't want anyone to take the wrong way because every woman doesn't have this on a goal, but some of us want to also be pretty. Um, some of us want to be fit. Uh, some of us want to, you know, to have family goals that are accomplished. So it's a, a, a serious balance. I waited tables in law school and only twice did I drop the big platter onto people. Uh, sorry if it was anyone here, but I mean, it's just like walking through, you know, narrow ways full of glasses on that platter um, and full of hot plates. Um, it's, it's just exactly the same because, you know, if you're too strong, there, there are words for that. Yes. If you're too tough, there are negative words for that. And if you're too tough and a woman of color, ooh, you might be an angry black woman. Um, so, you know, I definitely think about the criticisms of Hillary. I think about how Michelle Obama was vilified uh, probably about 12, 13 years ago now. I mean, every part of women generally, no matter what your color, you're picked apart when you are on a large stage where, oh my God, is that white nail polish? What is that about? A red blouse, you're a Democrat, wear blue. I mean, who knows what it's going to be? It sounds silly, but women are always under a microscope and to, to be liked is usually to be passive sometimes. And depending on what type of leader you have to be, you know, you can't just be passive. Um, you have to actually put your feet down and make some people at times strategically uncomfortable because you're standing up for the folks who have you in that position. Thank you. Um, another sort of generic question to all of you is, um, have you ever had to make yourself genderless in order to get your point across or to be heard in a room that is predominantly male? I know when I present and get passionate about it, my voice tends to go an octave higher, which I work really hard to lower so that I don't sound um, uh, like a woman, I guess. <laughs> Um, have you, any of you had to deal with, with that? I can't say that, um, that I have usually when, and, and maybe from my training of being a lawyer, I tend to lower my tone and it usually does make an impact. Um, but I will say early on in my career that um, I would go to court. I would sit where the lawyers were allowed to sit, which was usually the first bench in the courtroom. And invariably a judge would point to me and say, you Missy, is your lawyer here? Oh. Um, you know, and I would stand up and all the men would sort of snicker and I'd say, your honor, I am the lawyer, I'm waiting for my client or my client's ready when our case is called. Um, but I don't think that um, I have I have dealt in, in any of my various careers, uh, working in the city of Chester as, as the city solicitor. Uh, I never found that that I had to change the way I was speaking or, or what I was saying. Uh, people would would say to me, a lot of the employees were my friends outside of 
of work. And when I would come in and make statements, they'd go, oh, she has her solicitor's hat on, um, which was sort of telling me that I was being bossy, I guess. Uh, but my comment was, yes, I, that's what I have to do. This is a work subject. But um, I, don't, I never thought I had to change the way I was presenting. Uh, I was questioned about being a female in a male oriented area, which was the solicitor's office. But uh, a gentleman one time came to the window and asked to see the solicitor. The secretary came and got me out of the office. But it was my duty day. And when I went out and, and he said to me, no, I'm waiting for the solicitor. And I said, sir, I am one of the assistants. And he sort of looked at me and said, no, I want a male assistant. And I said, well, sir, I'm, you know, I'm here, I can help you and absolutely not. So I went back in and sat down and the secretary came in and she said to me, what am I gonna do? And I said, well, he's gonna stand there until tomorrow morning because there's not gonna be a male solicitor in. Um, but, you know, I, it didn't change the way I approached what I was doing. I never felt the need to do that. I don't know, Merle, did you have to change in, in being a superintendent? No, uh, one of the things I prided myself on was developing good rapport and relationships with all constituents from the very beginning and generating respect to others brought respect to myself. Mm -hmm. Answer. Um, I have uh, one, one last question, um, sort of a generic to everybody question. Um, do you all think that your male colleagues even really understand um, the need for ERA? I, I, I don't know. I, you know, when, when you hear how long we've been trying to pass it, and Laurie, you and I spoke a little bit about this before. Um, it's something that, that was very big in the 1970s and, mm -hmm. and we sort of remember people being very excited and this is gonna pass and- ERA, yay. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure that it's even on anybody's radar. I don't, I can't remember the last time anyone really discussed it. You know, we, we see the news articles and whether or not they should stick to the deadline that the, the that they had it passed by uh, 1986 or whatever the year was. I don't know that any, anybody even comments. Well, I think that's a perfect um, closing statement, Stefan. Um, because this, this is why Delaware County Historical Society is deciding to host these virtual conversations. We're bringing to light important historic and current issues that maybe a generation or two don't understand or don't think about or aren't present right now. And um, I thank all of you, uh, Judge Cartesano, Dr. Horowitz, Representative McClinton, Professors May and Kelly and Stefan, you're the, you're the moderator of, of, you're the greatest moderator. But I thank all of you because I do think it's important for a historic society, the Historic Society of Delaware County to bring this, these issues to light to start conversations, to get people to think about these issues, to bring them to the forefront, because there is still inequality in race and gender. Um, and that's a perfect way to, to close it out. And I thank you all. And the thank pleasure you. being your moderator host or whatever my title is. We'll do this again soon, right, right Laurie? Right, we will. Right. Okay. Thank you so much to all of you and to our attendees. Please come visit us and visit us at padelcohistory.org and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night all.